Hi everyone, welcome to another exciting edition of Adventure in Comics, a uh, sort of podcast here with words, images, and worlds, and guest Matt Slay. Matt, thank you for jumping in. Thank, thank you, you for having for me. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you for the the amazing shot composition as well. <laughs> uh, everything is framed up very nicely. Uh, yes. That's uh, a peril of uh, the comics. Once you've been making comics for long enough, everything is... How do we balance that out? Or is a lack of balance the key to a better story? Like everything yeah. is composition. Yeah, yeah. Uh love it. Love the the shelfies as well. The the <laughs> shout outs to uh books behind you. I'm just sort of many books. Many, yes. many books. Yes, absolutely. It's a must. Um speaking of books, I, I'm going to name a couple of the titles that you've worked on here, um, mm -hmm. just so folks can kind of connect. Uh, one of those being, of, of course, you, you've worked in some shared material, shared universe material like uh -huh. EMNT, um, Equilibrium, which was a Christian Bell movie from the way back. But a, it a nice was as well. And uh, boy, I was you, you have no idea how elated I was to be a part of that because it was one of those movies that I just fell in love with yeah. because it kind of slid under the radar. It was mm -hmm. a lot of fun, but it came out against much bigger things. So. Uh, inevitably the smaller budget thing is going to get buried by the bigger budget thing. Right, um, right. But I love that movie. And uh, the good folks at American Mythology um, kind of reached out and said, I, we got these things that we're working on. I said, Ooh, that I want uh -huh. equilibrium. And they, you've heard of that? Yes, I have. <laughs> I <was. laughs> very nice. Very nice. Yeah. I, I'm also a fan. Anything Christian Bale was doing in the early two thousands, I feel like is, uh, mm -hmm. among the best and um science fiction of course mm -hmm. being a go-to for me and um you've illustrated the work of timothy zahn as well speaking of science yeah fiction. he he was one of the authors that pitched in on a, a couple of uh, two or three volumes of a, a sci-fi anthology called mm -hmm. time travel tales and uh see ron garner reached out and said we're putting this thing together here are the authors that are involved. And I saw the list and it was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Timothy's on the list of uh, um, Aaron Alston, Gene Ravy, like that. I'm not questioning that. I want to be involved because yeah. if I'm not learning anything from another artist contributing, then I'm going to be able to learn something from how a writer is conveying their own ideas mm -hmm. and determining if I'm translating that correctly. So that was on the job training. That was a feather in my cap. That was fanboy dream come true. Yeah, uh, that's right. just one of those projects that I'm constantly trying to one up myself on that because I don't know if I'll ever get that opportunity again. Uh, yeah, that was very great. Cool. Very cool. Um, one of those foundational authors from again thinking about like the the seventies, the eighties, and working Star Wars, mm -hmm. Star Wars, and uh, just amazing. Uh, voice and um, the the last work that I'll mention is something called uh, Patchwork Ends. It's my well. baby, yeah, yes. that's my yeah. first IP. That like my first IP. Yeah. So um, that that's another one where I've been making comics or contributing to painting covers for comics for a long time, and I just thought I have so many ideas beyond what publishers and editors want from me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they all want that they all want to see that but not necessarily the way that i want to do it so i just thought maybe now's the time to jump off go into the deep end publish my own create my own have my own yeah but that means yeah. being responsible for writing your own designing your own laying out your own yeah. <laughs> drawing painting inking everything <laughs> um except the lettering and i can admit this that, that is a part of my brain that does not exist I understand yeah. lettering in comics compositionally, but the physical act of doing the same thing over and over and over, sometimes a mm -hmm. hundred times on one page. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a whole other kind of magic that, that I yeah. don't even understand. Yeah, I, I love the guys that are helping me out in that department. I do because without them, I, you know, I'd probably be sunk. But but Patchwork Ends uh, mostly came about because there are so many different kinds of writing Mm -hmm. uh, writing in any language is kind of the same as hearing various dialects in any spoken language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're, we're all speaking English, but depending on what part of the country you're in, it could sound completely different. Uh, yeah. So I, I wanted to start experimenting with different kinds of writing. 
And what that meant was experimenting with different kinds of drawing. And Patchwork Ends is my horror anthology that allows me to write things different ways, uh, create artwork different ways, different mediums, different approaches. Some of it's very basic. Some of the stories look like a coloring book. Some of the stories are fully painted. <laughs> it just depends on what it calls for. And I wanted it to be horror because, and the astute reader knows this, horror is every genre. Yeah. It's not just one genre. Uh, you want a cowboy story? We got that. You want a Viking story? I got that. You want the zombies? You want the vampires? You want the aliens? You want all the stuff? We can do all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and horror, that. yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. th there needs to be room for comedy and horror. Uh, otherwise, you're not offsetting the tension with anything. And then the tense moments aren't so tense. They just kind of run a little bland. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to be boring. That's the worst thing in the world is boredom when you're being entertained. Mm -hmm. Not entertained anymore, um, but yeah, it's horror gave me a, a back a backstage pass to everything else. Yeah, yeah there's there doesn't seem to be a ceiling with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm curious by means of like your origins, um, what what got you into visual storytelling? What what was the point where you said comics <laughs> and art? This is the thing for me. That's that's going to have kind of a two sided answer because there's a reality to it. And then there's the thing that you don't realize until you're much older. Uh, uh -huh. The reality is my own inability to read uh, reading, retention and comprehension was not a thing for me. Mm -hmm. I could read, you know, you stand in front of the class and you read the thing. Or, you know, if, if you're I guess for me, when it was when I was young enough, it was Hardy Boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, issues of Ranger Rick and World and Zoo Books and that stuff previous to comics. But I'm not remembering anything. I was one of those kids who could read the whole page, get to the end, and then the teacher says, well, what does that mean to you? I don't know. Well, what did you just read? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the myth from the outside looking in is that the kid's not paying attention or just being bashful. The reality is sometimes when a kid or a student says, I don't know, they really don't know. Yeah. They did the thing you asked them to do. I did the thing I was asked to do. I have no idea why. And I have no idea what it meant. So mm -hmm. it was retention and comprehension that were a challenge for me. Somewhere between fourth and fifth grade, I think it was closer to fourth grade or at least the summer of fourth grade. And I say that because I remember my very first comic. And I believe... It was Uncanny X-Men. I think it was 244. It was bright yellow cover, mm -hmm. uh, white logo, red outline, Mark Silvestri pencils, first appearance of Jubilee. You don't know that when you're like nine. Right, right. <laughs> but You're just enjoying I, the a, story. Yeah, yeah. but and here's the part where you look back when you're older and you start to deconstruct your origin story. Mm. Um, I know it was the first appearance of Jubilee because when you get a little older and you're a comic collector, boy, do those first appearances matter. Uh, <laughs> so I it was one of those things where I ended up with that comic somehow and comics weren't necessarily on the radar unless the church was having a yard sale and mom and dad brought home a stack of something for me to look at and what happened was I could read that and the pictures forced my brain to put the story together in a way that the, just having the words couldn't the story for me came from the pictures. And if there was dialogue in there, great. I know who said it. But the exercise became define using the pictures to define the narrative, not the words. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Nine times out of ten, when you ask somebody in an English class or a reading class, and if you go back far enough early in life, before you take English, you take language. They just call it language. Right, right. Back in the 70s and 80s. Um you know, it was all about the words. The wordsmithing was everything. Well, mm -hmm. that wasn't sinking in, but somehow the pictures did. And I was able to tell mom everything that happened. This is what happened. They were at the mall. There was a little girl. Her name was Jubilee. She got in trouble, but she didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And all the other, you know, Storm was there and Jean was there. And they, they were, I think Rogue was there and they were helping her get away from angry mall cops. And she didn't even do anything. And my, wow, you remember that? Yeah. And this guy named Mark drew it. 
and this guy over here wrote it and that guy letter it and there's an anchor what's an anchor i don't know but he did that you know nice, nice. suddenly i had it all yeah. the the visual narrative allowed me to essentially learn to read because before that there was a there was a reading program in talbot county maryland at the time called uh, junior great books and actually a remedial reading after school program to get kids brought up to their expected reading level. Mm -hmm. And this is before the days of standardized everything. If you were left behind, you were left behind. Sorry, kid, tough it up. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, so you, you, you learn to catch up and even that didn't work, but somehow comics worked. Um, and after a year or two of reading comics, I couldn't stop reading. I read everything. And uh, that's a double-edged sword for parents listening at home because Mitch Hedberg said it best. Every kid is a children's book if your kid can read. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, as a teacher, I appreciate that story so much. And as a comics fan, I also appreciate it. As, as a visual person, I'm wondering if that, that X symbol back there on your wine rack was a uh, sort of visual foreshadowing oh. <laughs> of your origin now since we talked uh, about the composition just saying <laughs> hey I, I love the subconscious nature of comics uh, right. <laughs> i'll take it as that I'll, I'll be telling people that from now on but really all it is is a way for me to store bottles horizontally so the corks don't dry out that that makes sense that makes sense <laughs> um yeah but but i love that story and i love uh x-men as being one of the first books that that grabbed you um Curious I don't think about... any other book could have. Yeah, you know, X Men is the from nineteen. What is it? September sixty three when they came out. Was it September sixty three? I don't know. I wasn't there. That but, sounds uh, about right. That sounds yeah. pretty close. Um, that book has been at, at its core and will probably be the collection of misfits that society didn't want to have anything to do with. Mm -hmm, and I've mm -hmm. always been that kid, you know, never the cool kid, never the popular guy, never whatever. It doesn't matter because I had a place to go and the X-Men understood me. And Professor X was right there at the front door to say, you can come here and learn. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we want you to learn, but we want you to do it responsibly. Let us teach you how to be a better person and control those, that negativity, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to be a dyed in the wool X Men fan. Oh, totally, totally. Uh, that's the significance of it, and uh, the ways that people can connect with it is is amazing. It really is astonishing, even one might say. <laughs> it's uncanny. It really <laughs> is. It really is. Um, <laughs> yes, I said that. Yes. Um, so curious about what it's what it's like for you to work in your own universes like again patchwork ends uh versus like equilibrium and um some of those other pieces okay perfect um well let's start with patchwork because that's the highly individualized th this is where it starts to sound a little egomaniacal but when you're creating something you have to take that approach in some aspects so with patchwork it is an anthology that can go in any direction at any given time Mm -hmm. Every volume of Patchwork is four stories um, until we do a collected hardcover, in which case I'll be adding some bonus stories because there, there are some that are fun, but maybe I, nah, they're not quite there. Or maybe there are some that are a little too heavy, uh, but we'll sneak those stories in later. But yeah, four stories. And I, I want them all to follow a theme of one form or another. And that theme is going to be defined by the imagery on the cover. Uh, that keeps me on track as a writer. I don't want to go so far off the rails to put four stories between two covers mm -hmm. and they don't have anything to do with each other at all. So for volume one, very basic artwork, very basic writing, very basic morality tales. Some of it is scary. Some of it is not. Some of it's a ghost story. Some of it is someone making a judgment call, but they are essentially morality tales. That is a very basic concept. What a great, what a great place to start with a number one. This mm -hmm. is basic. Mm -hmm. If if you enjoyed it, I'll see you for round two, volume two. It's a lot more complicated, much more narrative, character driven narrative, uh, and with that, more rendered black and white painting, ink wash painting artwork, 
And for one of the stories, I'm experimenting with poetry and I'm using a wet wash, chisel tip pen. The artwork is going to be a little bit more Shel Silverstein mm -hmm. uh, kind of an influence. And the cadence of the writing goes hand in hand with that. But I'm also taking methods of poetry and incorporating it in to balance out that cadence. So all those stories seem to have a water element. Mm -hmm. So I want the writing to flow a little bit more. So that's the experiment with volume two. Nice, nice. Volume three, it's a past, present, and future thing. If volume one is the past, where was I? How did this all start? Volume two is my sandbox. I'm comfortable here. I'm going to let loose. Volume three, I have no idea what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's going to be full color rendered painting, different painting styles, different methods and material, very multimedia approach. Uh, and the writing is going to reflect that. Uh, one of my biggest influences is music. And I find that the best creative writing on the planet comes from the people who can create a rhythm and a meter to convey those ideas mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of a strong songwriter. I have never done that before. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> nice. much like what i have planned with the artwork for volume three i've never done it before so i'm going to do it that's what patchwork is patchwork ends is a place where i can go and stomp around and be creative but i need to be responsible enough to make a quality product out of it mm -hmm. long term i would like patchwork to be a place where other creators can come to get their idea out i think every comic writer and artist is at all times suffering from the old adage you can't get a job without experience but how can you get experience without a job right right mm -hmm. now current industry metric refutes that anybody can dump anything online and say i make comics okay <laughs> <laughs> but there's a there's a responsibility and a craft and a history to this mm -hmm. and that has to be respected so the thousands of people who put their stuff online and never make a dime and it only lasts a year or two. Mm -hmm. They're, they're the angry voices of, well, you know, comics broke me. No, you just broke. Yeah. Yeah. Comics doesn't break anybody. If you have it in you to make comics, you are, you are here. We're happy to have you. Um, but it means putting the work in, putting the time and developing. You have got to fail a thousand times before you succeed. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to, want you to succeed for them until they've seen you succeed on your own i've done both i have failed myself and i have failed others and now i have in the last decade or so learned how to succeed for both and it's harder than you can imagine yeah, yeah. <laughs> but patchwork gives me the opportunity to succeed for myself or fail for myself on my own terms and build an intellectual property where other artists who have hit a brick wall can come to publish are you a writer and no one wants you want to tell a horror story you want to tell any kind of sci-fi story and and your current publisher won't let you you come talk to me are you an artist that wants to pencil you've been penciling your whole life and you're a genius penciler what a great penciler you are but you want to paint something but no one wants to see that well we got painters we need you to pencil you come see me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i want you to do what you want to do well the only editorial or coaching i would give you is to make sure that my final product is a quality product, but I'm not gonna tell you what to write or how to write it or what to paint or how to paint it. I just wanna make sure that I have a cool product at the end of the day. And now you've got whatever story you create, it's your IP, you own that. That's your baby. Nice. Take it with you when you're done or hang out and stay. It's a cool place where I want creators to be creative. Now, mm -hmm. something like Equilibrium, see, we come back around. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's a very, very different sandbox to play in. It's a gift because the publisher, in this case, American Mythology, said, we got the license to this thing. Would you like to be involved? And I said, oh, my gosh, I love that thing. I would love to be involved, mm -hmm. in which case it's cool. What would you like to do? Well, I want to do this because these scenes are my favorite and the, the, the narrative is telling me this and the story is telling me that. And they say, excellent throw down some layouts we'll approve them here are the rules because you know ultimately the studio owns that movie or whatever the rules are mm -hmm. and, and the rules are usually going to be stricter involving likeness rights and 
the marching order for me was we can do all these things and we can have iconography and visuals from the movie, mm -hmm. but you can't do Christian's likeness. Mm -hmm. That's that that's off limits because we could put a photo of him in the corner box because we, you know, that's marketing. Uh, we have permission to do that from the studio. And, and these are the intricacies of licensing that I'm happy to not always be involved in. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a lot easier for me for the publisher or the editor to say, here are your orders, go do this. And then my personality is just, yeah, no problem. And then I guess I just go do what I'm told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they seem to, they seem to like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm a creative person, but I'm not overly rebellious when it comes to playing in someone else's living room. You know, yeah. um, that's what, that's what patchwork is for. Patchwork is for me to break the rules that I've spent a career following. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I go to work on a licensed product or go to work for another publisher, an IDW, a boom, a Marvel, a DC, a whoever, it doesn't matter. I am a guest in their house. And you don't put your feet up on somebody's furniture. You know what I mean? Just be polite. Right, Just right. follow the rules and be a good guest. Um, I'll put the feet up in patchwork. Yeah, I like that metaphor. It's a great metaphor. Yeah. Uh, uh, along the way, you, you mentioned um, some of the, the collaboration. I, I know you have a collaborator who's also helped you uh, visually design our meeting as well. Um, oh, so, Peter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so curious about shout outs to um, positive collaborations, experiences that you've had, oh, uh, supportive folks along the way. I, I would say, um, you know, anything that has to do immediately with computers and technology. I, I have a pencil and paintbrushes. <laughs> I'm the weird guy at the convention that I'm noticing is still working using non-digital media i've had people come to my table and say wait if i ask you to draw this you can do it right now well yeah <laughs> where do you think all this came from right you know? right <laughs> uh i get why digital is useful and saves a lot of time but i think for my own like psychology and spirituality if i'm not physically making comics the traditional means i don't know why i'm here mm -hmm. but good collaborations obviously um all of this, like the that thing and the ring, there's like a light that's round. And mm -hmm. I guess 21-year-old girls on the internet understand those things. I don't know. Um, I'm going to be forever screaming to everyone get off my lawn, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I need folks who understand the modern ways uh, to help me get across my ancient dialect. Um, <laughs> but as far as comics go, um i'm only gonna name drop somebody if it comes with a very positive very positive place and a very positive Perfect. means i'm not gonna trash anybody because i've had bad experiences and i have no doubt that others have had a bad experience with me that's okay <laughs> <laughs> um first and foremost i i think it i think it behooves every creator to be cognizant and appreciative of the promoters who took a chance on you Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you're young enough and new enough and all you know is a big empty room full of tables and people that are just like you somebody took a chance on you and said okay i like what you're doing i want to put you on a stage i want to see how you handle it because up to a certain point you're just a pencil in a table in a room full of tables you're a production artist that's all you do you don't mean anything you've mm -hmm. just been given the opportunity to come into this room and sit down and draw the thing that you've been told to draw in my case, it was doing layouts and storyboards for commercials and newspapers and magazines and uh, things like that. Um, storyboarding for commercials, I actually still really love because nowadays where everything is done for digitally in production, I can go to a production meeting and while they're spending three to four hours mapping out how they're going to tell the story, I'm over here with a Sharpie and I've already mapped out your whole commercial and i just turn it in quietly here you're done <laughs> and um no oh, they can't believe it it's amazing um yeah i just drew this just right now lighting direction shot composition it's all done here you go mm -hmm. um didn't need an ipad or anything imagine that so yeah i love that stuff but uh yeah the promoters that are willing to take a chance on you for me uh very early it was brett carreras and chris garvey 
um, allowed me into that convention life. And they said, you know, you, you got, you got something kid, let's see where you can take it. And they were the guys who put me out there and, you know, got me a lot of my first cover work. Really. Uh, Brett was responsible for the Ninja Turtle stuff that happened. Oh, nice. Um, nice. That I don't think that ever would have happened if it weren't for him. And that is still one of the crown jewels for me of my career. I'm a lifelong diehard Ninja Turtle fan. I was there in the beginning when Mirage Studios was called Mirage because nobody knew if it was going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> 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 so, I, and by there in the beginning, I mean, I was a kid reading old copies of Ninja Turtles that were slightly oversized mm -hmm. and had that red accent cover because I think there was only money in the budget for one color print. <laughs> so, yeah. it's, I'm a turtle guy through and through. So, much love to Brett for that. Um, you know, Chris Garvey is a promoter. He owns a Virginia Comic Con. Uh, no, he has a Roanoke Valley Comic Con. Brett is Virginia Comic Con. And uh, Chris, his way of getting me out there was introducing me to vendors and other promoters who could help me understand the business side of comics from the retailer point of view. Mm -hmm. He never had a problem with me coming into the shop and sitting in the back quietly drawing, like working on scripts and layouts and then seeing how, oh, you, from the time that you start drawing this thing to the time we put it on the shelf, these are the conversations that take place at the distribution level. I got an education from Mr. Garvey, definitely, and I'm still getting an education from him. I can't be there all the time because uh, I'm just, it seems like I'm busier and busier these days. But uh, I got I'm still getting an education from Chris. Um, and, and then, of course, once you get to another level, you start to travel more. Mm -hmm. And in my travels, I, I started to meet guys like Sheldon Drum and Mark Nathan, mm -hmm. who are responsible for two of the greatest conventions on the planet, let alone just this one country. These are shows that focus on the creators. Mm -hmm. You might have a celebrity in the room. But it's not all about them. These are two shows that still understand it's about comics. Yeah. And there is a life and a love and a passion to this extraordinarily visual communication that is ironically a visual communication translated through reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They get that. And they've in the past allowed me to come along and play. And I and I get to draw and I get to paint and I get to see it, my other artist buddies and my writer buddies. And um uh, I mean, you want to talk about an extraordinary chunk of life. You know, it's one weekend a year, but it's worth it every mm -hmm. single time. And I owe these guys everything. And then on the other hand, I, I have the more direct production level where I just, I don't even know if I can say great collaboration so much as I owe these people my life, my, my professional life. Uh, you know, Jim Q. Hork, he's the one who brought me equilibrium. You know, yeah. he, he's over American mythology. If it hadn't been for Jim, I, I don't that, I know that wouldn't have happened. And he he introduced me to uh, some artists that have been influences on me that I've known that I, I didn't even know were influences on me. He, he put out a he wrote a book called Dead Irons, which is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant from start to finish. The art, the writing, all of it. I love Dead Irons. It's actually on that shelf. Nice, um, nice. <laughs> let's see. Who else? I mean, Ron Garner, of course, uh, from Time Travel Tales. And that collaboration just came from, I think we we met at Shiva Khan so many years ago. Um, and Timothy Zahn was the writing guest of honor at Shiva Khan. And we were all just sort of mingling. And there, there comes a point at a convention where some group of people is going to try and close the bar. <laughs> um, and we did. And uh, that's how that happened. It was, hey, what if we got you and you and you and you and you and we just did this thing? Yes, I'm in. I think a lot of the positive collaborations that happen are only going to happen if if it begins with one of you, if not both of you, being willing to say, yes, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no, don't just think or be afraid of, but know that it's going to take directions that you weren't ready for mm -hmm. and maybe you don't like. But you said yes. So it's on you to make it a positive collaboration. If it's going to be negative, 
it's because somebody was saying no and not willing to yield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At that point, I feel like it's not a collaboration at all. Mm -hmm. In the times that I have had a negative uh, experience with that, it's because I didn't feel like I was collaborating. It just felt like I'm the only guy in the belly of the ship rowing and somebody upstairs keeps changing the course. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why are we changing the course? We were on track. The deadline's right there. Okay, we'll just turn the boat around. Are you going to help me? Right. right. Can I get some help turning the boat around? Um, so it, at that point, when it no longer feels like a collaboration, that's when it's a negative one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think a, a really good collaboration I just had, and, and it was a great experience for me. Because I learned a lot. Um, I just did an issue of Crossing for Red Silo Media. Yeah. And uh, Enrica is an amazing writer. And she's put together a story in Crossing that I fell in love with very, very quickly. She sent me the first six issues digitally to get kind of caught up with what the story is. Mm -hmm. And I love it. And because uh, it was touching on horror themes, but it was so much more dramatic and character driven. It came from somewhere very personal for her. And I, and I felt that. And I'm reading the script that I'm going to be working from, and there are all kinds of things that I've never had to dive into before, but I really enjoy. And there, the train is a big visual. The trains are very important for the story, or at least for the story I was on, the chapter I was on. And I thought, I love trains. Ever since I was a little kid, ask my grandmother how much I wanted to go to the train museum every time I would come and visit. I love trains. Very Sheldon Cooper. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And... Um, <laughs> I, I thought this is my chance. No one's ever asked me to draw a train before. So I didn't, but I can. So let's do it. A lot mm -hmm, of fun. Mm -hmm. And once, once we got to the, the pen, the layouts, the pencils, the inks, things like that. Now it comes time to change some things. And now we're, now we're doing the editor thing. This is not something to be afraid of. I, I every time I do a convention, I, I hear plenty of people say, Oh, my editor wants this and this and this. Why are you so mad? Right. Why are you so mad? You have the opportunity to flex your problem solving skills very quickly. And for me, the lesson I learned from her was her background is is very much in animation. So she has an expectation of how this stuff is supposed to look based on a very broad career in animation. And she's very good at it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that. See, that that one piece of new information is key. Mm -hmm. Because now, now it's easy for me to change directions. Oh, now I know what she's expecting. So now I can make these changes without issue. I just, I just learned something. Right, right. In a medium that I've been in for two decades, <laughs> I just learned something. Yeah. So Enrica and Red Stylo were an extraordinarily positive experience for me. That's a great collaboration. If I'm coming out of there with new knowledge that's going to make me better at my job, if I'm going to make patchwork better because of that, then easily crossing is one of the most important things I've ever done. Mm -hmm. So big shout out to her. Mm -hmm. And she's a, and she's an Edgar Allan Poe fan. And, and so am I. So. <laughs> how, how can you not be, how can you not be a Poe fan? Really? <laughs> it, it's pretty hard. Uh, yeah. There's an entire aesthetic dedicated to this man's collars. So absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate, I really appreciate what you're saying about being in comics for decades and continuing to learn. You mentioned the Gary Martin interview that I did uh -huh. um, right before we were recording. And uh, that was one of the things that he talked about as well, continuing to challenge yourself, continuing to grow as an artist and a storyteller. So uh, mm -hmm. much appreciation there for the the continued work forward. It's a, it, it's a delicate thing, but it's an important thing. And, and I've seen too many times for illustrators and artists, uh, maybe over time your body gets old enough and maybe there's nerve damage and I get it. That's one thing, but to let things slip and degrade, mm -hmm. that to me is one of the most sad, unfortunate, most unacceptable things you can ever do, uh, especially as a creator. So I think you need to be challenging yourself. I, if you see something in comics or in reading or in literature that you love, absorb that. If you don't love it, if you hate it, if you're actually against it, now you really need to absorb that because somebody's just challenged your idea of something. And they might have a point of view that you didn't know about, uh, and they might actually have better information than you do. So it, changing your idea about some things, changing your mind, 
that is so much more valuable to the creative process um, than, than I think too many people realize. Mm -hmm. And um, I know between the cuts, between the edits, we had mentioned all the different places and spaces to find uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. all the different social media avenues. I, I keep myself limited in that respect. I, I do have a Facebook page. I'm easy to find. Um, Patchwork Ends, you can find either directly from me, uh, the original art. I am represented by Comic Art House, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. comicarthouse.com. Um, as far as the book goes, it's published through Broken Icon. And their website, last time I checked, was under construction because they're revamping the whole thing because they have a massive promotion, a massive new upgrade coming for 2024. So I'm very excited. Uh, but the book will be available to order either from brokeniconcomics.com or from me directly. And I'm easy to work with. You can send me a private message on Facebook. I will get it. But I do not have Twitter or X or Instagram or what's another one? Tumblr, really? Okay. <laughs> I don't have any of that. That is where people go to pass judgment, get angry, get in fights, lose jobs, forsake income, revenue streams yeah. disappear. I I got <laughs> I don't have time for that. So yeah, Facebook is easy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My email is easy. Broken icon is easy. You know, uh comic art house is, is my forever home, I hope. Um but yeah, it, I mean as far as reaching me, I'm very easy to get through Facebook. And, uh, you know, if someone's looking to start a project or they have they need advice on a project, absolutely reach out. I don't charge for stuff like that. I knowledge. I don't know going to charge for that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Paying it forward, passing the baton. I, I can't begin to list the number of people who have sat down with me and said, you're doing well, but here's what's wrong. Here's mm -hmm. why you're wrong. Here's how to correct that. And here's how to make it profitable or, you know, expansive for yourself. Yeah. That list is too long, but you know, it includes amazing people like Steve Scott. Phenomenal. Um, I, I will never forget. Then again, we closed the bar and that was at a convention. I feel like that was 2010. <laughs> it was me, Steve Scott, Joe Jusco and, Scott Lamke was there and, and we sat in this bar looking at just pouring over Wally Wood portfolio pieces, uh, just pages of Wally Wood. How do you not learn that? That's a learning experience. That's a, that's a PhD level course over drinks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with those guys. I took Best way to do word. a PhD level course. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't send somebody 30 grand a year. If you can just give us a call and we can just have a drink and talk, please. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, but yeah, those guys, um, Don Rosa sitting next to him and Joe Staten and Ramona Frayden at Baltimore, just being clustered in between them. Yeah. And suddenly I don't even care that I make comics because I am 12 years old again. <laughs> and I'm sitting with a Mount Rushmore of cartooning, asking very clear questions. Don't, it's not about which question you ask can have more weight than how many you asked. So you know, you go to the conventions, speak to the people who know, mm -hmm. learn everything you can and never stop. And if somebody has an idea that you don't like, or maybe you heard a rumor about them or that person's, a, he said this on that website, who cares? Go talk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go talk, experience what is different. Determine if it can expand your arsenal as a writer or an artist, take it with you and apply it accordingly. You know, Love that. Yeah. reach out and be open about what you want so that you can be open and ready to shift, adjust based on what your project needs. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said, Matt. Very well said. I appreciate the time. I appreciate the talk. Did we miss anything that you want to make sure to mention before we close out? Patchwork Ends is amazing. <laughs> we should all be buying thousands of copies. That's right. Uh, That's right. <laughs> shameless self-promotion um let's see i uh, i can't think of a whole lot i think my next convention appearance is going to be big lake comics mm -hmm. uh in roanoke uh big lake comic con in roanoke is in february and uh those guys jd and adam sutfin um they know how to throw a party uh yeah. they own big lake comics they're in roanoke in virginia it's, it's an amazing store and uh if, if you want to come to a convention that is just 
the most fun. It, it, the whole room is your family. It, nice. it is a party from start to finish. And it is just a smile. Your face cramps after three days of having a big, goofy grin on your face. It's great. <laughs> they they do such a good job. And uh, they, they have their fingers on the pulse of what retail comics and the comics community is, is moving into. Mm-hmm. Not just where it is and where it's going, but what it can be as well. Uh, two captains of a ship that deserve captains of their quality. So... Um, you know, shout out to them. And I hope to see if you're in the Roanoke area, if you're in Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, North Carolina, please make the trip. Uh, Big Lick is so much fun. It's so much fun. Cool, cool. Well, but other awesome. than that, it's all about patchwork for me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, on that note, I will say thank you again. May the creating continue and, and hope to see you in Roanoke. I, oh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. There is one thing I would be remiss not to say. Um, mm-hmm. I have been quietly, so, somewhat secretly, uh, doing providing illustration for a children's book called uh, "A Mossing for Gate," oh, and um, cool. Barry Napier has spent quite a while building a world that is not unlike the Hundred Acre Wood. So the internal aesthetic is going to be very Hundred Acre Wood. So if you are of the classics mm-hmm. and that that woodcut design artwork and, and the Hundred Acre Wood style is your thing. I definitely think you should check out at, uh, at Mossing for Gate. That will come out January 8th. So we're coming up on that. Yeah. We're mm-hmm. about two weeks out. Um, so January 8th is when that happens. And uh, he and I have been bouncing around an idea for something else, a little bit more horror themed later. But uh, at Mossing for Gate is on the way, and Barry's taken a lot of time to world build for sure. Uh, so on January 8th, I hope everybody will really dive in and go searching for that. I'll be promoting it like crazy. So again, hit me up on Facebook. Uh, follow me there because I'll be sharing that quite a bit. Cool, cool. I'll make sure to have this out by January 8th. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to talk again anytime. Yes, sir.